Well, hello, good morning. Welcome back to the Alaska Sea Life Center for another live virtual visit here. Uh, from the floor of the center, we've got some stuff going on behind us. So uh, we are open. The touch tanks are back behind us. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, maybe, because it ties back into today's program. But we're actually going to be getting outside for today's program. And if you notice, there's like some emergency gear and stuff back there. It's not an emergency. It's us being just prepared in case someone needs it. We actually have a diver in one of our tanks right now rearranging the rocks and the like. So if there's anything moving around, someone in a really weird suit back there, that's our diver. I think it's Chuck today. I think diver. it is Chuck, yeah. <laughs> uh, so again, my name's Alex and we've got Taylor for another virtual visit. We always want to thank our sponsor for these programs. So Royal Caribbean Group has made it possible for us to bring you these live every week, uh, Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Alaska time. And as always, we try to kick off with what, what it would be like if you were here because, uh, you know, virtual visits, the whole point is to bring you to the Sea Life Center. So we love showing you the Seward Sunrise. This morning's kind of weird. Uh, you won't see until towards the end, but, like, it was a nice sunny day, which we've been running into, right? But which then, has been great. Then this bank's coming in. Uh, so it might end up being a very cloudy day. Right now it is pretty overcast out there, actually. But you can see these clouds are coming in. This runs from, uh, like, 8.30 in the morning until 10.30 in the morning. Sun's already up by now. We've discussed this. Alaska, uh, we've still got like a couple more hours of sunlight to gain, I think. Uh, by the time we get to you know, uh, summer, uh, summer solstice, it's going to be pretty bright out there for a long time. We don't get the full 24 hours of sunlight, uh, but sometimes it feels like it. <laughs> so this morning's sunrise was a little odd. I thought it was going to be pretty boring, just the sun. But uh, nope, we've actually got those clouds coming in. So we'll have to see how that all plays out through the day. So as I mentioned, we're actually going to head outside for today's program. Now, we're still going to be here, but Taylor and I actually <laughs> had an opportunity to kind of tag along with the uh, aquarists here at the Sea Life Center. So our aquarium department is in charge of everything that's not birds or mammals. Uh, so they're all of our invertebrates. They're all of our vertebrate fish. Uh, if, you know, people are like, the octopus, who feeds that? Our aquarium department does. But they're also in charge of, you know, if we've got any plants that are growing, like marine plants. They'll, they'll have a hand in that as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll toss on over for our first trip here. We actually went out to the beach. It was a pretty sunny day, and we got Taylor flipping rocks. What were you, what, why were you flipping rocks? <laughs> I was here? flipping rocks looking for all sorts of tide pool animals. So we were looking for all sorts of invertebrates, looking for sea stars, gunnels, which are little types of fish, chitons, checking out all of the kelp and beautiful algae that was on those rocks. And we weren't alone, though. Like, the we aquarium weren't. department was out there. Uh, they were flipping rocks, too. You can see they have a little net. So, of course, the Alaska Sea Life Center, we've got a collection permit. We can go out here. We can flip these rocks. We always want to put them back exactly where we found of them. Course. If you ever go tide pulling, please don't lift any rocks. You won't be able to step back down gently. Uh, but we have a collection permit, which means if we find something out there that we want to bring back to uh, educate the public about, or sometimes if we find something we don't know what it is, uh, we'll bring that back as well. So they were out there... I don't know, a couple hours yeah. at, at low tide. We don't get a ton of uh, like tide pools. It's mostly this rock flipping that we have here. But at the end of the day, we took back, uh, I think there were three, three buckets they had. Three buckets. I had never done this before. So this was a very exciting thing for me to get to tag along with. Loved being able to flip the rocks, see what's underneath, find all the cool animals. Yeah, we had to take advantage of the low tide. Um, that's the thing is, obviously, if we're out at high tide, you're not going to be finding marine animals underneath all your rocks there because, well, they want to be underwater. So there are some animals there that can actually last while the tides are out. They can keep themselves kind of wet enough or uh, they can at least keep their gills uh, moist enough that by the time that water comes back in, they haven't just dried out. So things like sea stars try to be a little closer to the water. They don't want to be out for the whole time the tide's out. But, I mean, the rocks are covered with, like, Barnacles, barnacles and mussels. Sometimes yeah. eggs as well. The, yeah, we saw those the, the weird multicolored eggs in there, um, possibly from a sculpin. You know, they, there's a lot of little sculpins around there to lay those tiny eggs, um, but some sort of fish eggs. We didn't. I don't think we brought any of the eggs back. I but don't think so. What either. sort of stuff did we end up bringing back? I was just trip? about to ask you what kind of stuff that we brought. So we had a mossy chitin, yep. which is just a little guy who's probably about this big. We actually ended up taking the whole rock because he was stuck to the rock <laughs> and could not come off. Some crabs. We had a little pygmy rock crab. Yeah, rock some crab. other other little crabs. A hermit crab was an escapee. He he was not supposed to come. He came with <laughs> us, and now he's in our 
circular touch pool over mm -hmm. here. We had a couple sunflower sea stars. Yeah. So yeah. the ones with all of the arms, but they were only about yay big yeah. and bright, bright orange. And I mean, they're, they're that big now, but that's actually they're the gonna largest. They're going to grow. Yeah, that's right. the largest sea star we have here. Can't they get up to um, like three feet in about diameter? Three feet in yeah, about a meter. Yeah. So they'll, get, they'll just get huge. Um, and of course, like we have some in our touch tank. Those little ones tend to go in the touch tank, our Rocky Coast Discovery Pool back there. Um, but eventually they, they get big enough that we're like, oh, we got to move them to another habitat. So our bird habitat has them, for yep. example. Um, but they're, they're really fascinating. A lot of people see them and they don't, they're like, is, is that different from a sea star? Or my favorite is, is that an octopus? Is it an octopus? <laughs> well, no, uh, it's not an octopus, but also no, it is still a sea star. You know, people think maybe they're entirely different things, just a different type of sea star. Um, most people are used to kind of like the five-armed sea stars, and uh, these sunflower stars have more than five. Uh, they start with about six, uh, and then they just keep adding on arms up until like 20, 24 arms Yeah, or so. somewhere crazy like that. What about gunnels? We didn't so we found a lot of gunnels. We found the gunnels. So the gunnels are these little skinny fish, like Taylor mentioned, um, and they can survive under those rocks. When you when you pull the rock up, a lot of times they'd be kind of squirming around, and they look like a little worm or a snake or something. Snake. But but there, there, there are gunnels, or there's some sticklebacks that'll do that as well, where they can actually live out of the water directly, but they're in this damp underside of the rock, or we'll find them under kelp a lot too, if you're kind of uh, leafing through kelp where you're flipping over little bits of it that is left out at low tide. Uh, we'll find them in there yeah. as well. So we actually have a question right here. Perfect. Have you ever found an octopus while beach coming? Great question. Right line. Yeah, we didn't find one this trip, but we have found octopus in the past. We find we tend to find the really young ones Ooh, when okay. we're beachcombing, and that would be either um, you know the the tide gets out to its lowest, and we can still step out even a little further with our boots and get like some rocks and kelp that's still in the water, but right towards the edge. We found little octopus that way before. Um, there's other collection methods as well, right? This is us going out to the beach to collect, but they'll go out and dive to collect. They'll actually get down in the water pretty deep. Uh, looking for things there along, you know, under underwater cliffs and the like. Uh, they'll also do uh, nets where they'll actually get out in the water off the beach with a little net and kind of swoop it around back to the shore and see what they find that way. And we can get a lot of fish that way. We actually did bring back uh, another fish, a snail fish. Ooh, yes. It looked like a big old tadpole. Uh, really cool. And that one, I've seen it a couple times. It's not in a great spot to get good footage of it. No. Because it keeps, like, suction cupping itself really high up on this tank wall. Um, that's one of the things that the snailfish can do is it's got some fins. Uh, it's, uh, it's little pectoral fins, actually. It has them like in a suction cup and it can suction itself to, uh, to a wall. It's just these, uh, adapted fins. So you mentioned that, you know, what if our aquarists don't know what the animal is? Then that's when we would take it back, right? Yeah. So what are they, how do they idea it? So well, they get here and the first thing we have to do is after this big trip, I'm just going to pull up the, the sun again. Uh, or, or our beach trip, because it's nice, uh, nice footage just to see. But when we get back to the center, we get all this stuff. Uh, we have to write down what it is. Um, if we don't know what it is, we have to document it. We take a bunch of pictures, and then our course will go and try to figure out what it is. But we have to keep records of everything that we collect and everything we have in our collection here. So basically, they got back to the center with these buckets. They went back into a curatorial area. And they started like one at a time taking the, the animals out of the buckets, uh, putting them in tanks and writing down what they have, what tank it's going in and that sort of thing. Yeah. There's some of those true stars Alex was mentioning with the five arms. Mm. There's those eggs also <laughs> that we think are sculpin, which are a type of fish. So the octopus so. question was fun. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to type those in the chat. Uh, if you're not watching live, you can leave a comment as well. We'll try and get to those. Uh, or, you know, we do run that text line that we put at the beginning of these when we're live, and you can, you can text us a question there as well. Now, we mentioned that there are other ways to collect, like diving or uh, you know that, that net that they'll run along the beach. But even closer to the center, there's another way to collect. And we were able to tag along on this as well. We went with Steph, uh, one of our aquarists here. Now, she's got chopped up fish. That's not what we're collecting. That's what we're using to collect. So the Sea Life Center actually can put out uh, some traps for fish. And these have to get checked like frequently. Isn't um, it like every day? It's pretty much every day. Yeah. We have a couple traps that aren't traps so much as like, wouldn't it be nice to live in this thing? They can come in and out, but we make it really comfortable for them. Uh, and those can get checked uh, at a longer interval. But here you can see we brought up one of these fish traps. I actually did have a couple fish, just a couple of greenling, uh, which we didn't end up keeping. We, we have lots of greenling already. 
Um, these two just happen to be in the, in the wrong place, getting that trap, and so they get uh, put back out into the water. Um, but they do take everything out, put it in the bucket, take a look at it, uh, and then they can release uh, rather than bring it back to the center. So what's the point of these traps? Um, well, so we have participated in monitoring efforts in the past. Um, now, we also just keep these traps out to, for ourselves, kind of see what is out there. Um, you know, we're, we're curious of what's living back behind the center, uh, and it's just another way for us to more passively uh, collect at the same time. Very good. So we actually do have a couple questions over here. Alex, okay. do we only collect from Resurrection Bay? Okay, so that's a good question. Resurrection Bay is probably where like 90% of our collection occurs, maybe more. Uh, because it, it's our backyard, right? We could just walk on down to the beach and collect out there uh, pretty much any day. The weather's nice or the tide's really low. We can do that. Uh, we have animals that have come to the Sea Life Center from elsewhere around the state. Um, we've done collection efforts over in, say, Kachemak Bay by Homer, which is on the other side of the Kenai Peninsula from us here in Seward. Uh, for anyone, you know, uh, uh, joining us from afar and you're like, well, I don't know where any of these places are. If you look at a map of Alaska, you'll find Anchorage, it's quite a large city on the southern, uh, south central part of Alaska, but if you head south just a little bit, there's a peninsula there uh, that really sticks out into the Gulf. We are on, here in Seward, we are on the east side of that peninsula, and there's a town named, uh, called Homer over on the west side of the peninsula. We actually have another question here. Okay. It's kind of a fun one. Do the animals get along in the buckets? Oh, when, 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 <laughs> from when the, the from back to the beach coming. That's a good question. I mean, I guess it would uh, apply to the, the traps as well. The animals yeah. get along in the buckets. Um, we try to make sure they will. So most of these animals, you know, they're, they're like they're living under the rock. We flip the rock up, and they're like, oh, it's really bright. Something's happening. Their their lowest concern at that point probably is eating. So we don't, you know, we don't expect that they're just going to immediately pounce on their their bucket uh, neighbors, but. There are some animals that will actually try to kind of put in their own bucket. If we got a large sunflower sea star, for example, all the sunflower sea stars might go into their own cooler or their own bucket, just because uh, not only are they a, a pretty uh, dangerous predator for some of the other animals we might collect, but they also seem to be able to be sensed by some of those animals, maybe chemically, uh, like out like smelling, and they're like, ah, there's a predator in here with me too. So we do try to kind of separate them out if, if there's a predator and prey. We don't want to transport them in the same bucket, so that's one of the reasons that a lot of times we'll have multiple buckets. Looks like we're good here with questions right oh, now, perfect. but if you have any, please feel free to text us or uh, drop them in the okay. comments below. So I mentioned this was all going to come back around to the touch tank, and that's because the last time we were here at the Rocky Coast Discovery Pools, uh, we took a look at crustaceans, so our crab and our shrimp. And we showed our spot shrimp, which get quite large, and we were really proud because we actually have some female spot shrimp, uh, probably our oldest spot shrimp here right now, uh, and they have eggs. And we were waiting. We were like, I really wish they'd hatched in time for our uh, crustacean episode. Unfortunately, they hadn't, but you can see in this footage, they were so close. They were really close. The eggs, you could actually see the eye spots in them. Uh, and so any day then, we were expecting them to hatch. And they ended up, just this past week, they've kind of started hatching. We have hundreds of them now. Uh, and they're all just drifting around in their own tank. So they have a very special tank. But this is different, right? Like, this stage of their life, uh, this is a larval form. And they are planktonic at this point, which means they just drift around. And yes, they all do drift upside down. This, this footage is not upside down. They just kind of drift this way in the water column. And they are plankton, and there's a, a fancy word for them. Zoea. Zoea. Yeah, Z-O-E-A. <laughs> Their fancy term. So that uh, brings us back to today. And we, of course, have this plankton tank right back there. It's kind of that round circular one. It's only got uh, the little spot shrimp Zoea in it right now. But it is designed for holding plankton. And so that's another thing. A lot of people don't necessarily think about us going out and like collecting plankton. When you go to an aquarium, they might have a plankton tank, but a lot of times people are there for big animals. Um, and you might see some large plankton, like something like a jellyfish is large plankton. Uh, but we actually went out and collected plankton as well. So we tagged back along with uh, Steph and Kim this time. And we were able to go out and collect some plankton. Now for this, we have a very special net. We're going to have a, a more close-up look at this in a little bit, but we went over to a, a dock right next door. It's actually uh, from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, it has a dock here that they allow us to do our plankton tow off of. And this net has to go down in the water, and then we pull it 
back up through the water column pretty quickly. Uh, and so any plankton that's drifting around in that water column that this net cuts through uh, will get trapped in the net. And we don't actually want them on the net. The net itself uh, just kind of guides them down to the bottom. So you'll see uh, as we pull this net back up over the rail, it's actually got this little, it's like a little pipe down at the bottom. Yeah. A uh, little cup that collects all of the plankton down there and a bit of water. So we are not going to get the plankton out of the net, but the net guides the plankton down here, and then we only have to get the plankton out of that little thing. Uh, and so we toss them in the water. Now, as we said, a lot of times you don't go to an aquarium to see plankton, although they, there might be a plankton <laughs> tank like we have. And that's because if you look in this bucket, it looks, it looks pretty much empty. And even closer, uh, it doesn't look too exciting. Um, most plankton is very, very small. So we actually made the trip back to Central Lab. We've been here before. Uh, and you know they've got microscopes in Central Lab. So we were actually able to uh, take a look with a microscope at the animals. We didn't just fill the whole Petri dish because that would actually make it quite difficult to find any one planktonic animal. But instead we, uh, we do these little droplets. And you can see in that droplet there are some animals just cruising around in there, uh, and we wanted to get a more close-up look at them. And fortunately, we had the TV set up. So we're going to take a look at some of the plankton that we saw, because there's really some fascinating stuff in there. But before we do that, I, I want to show those nets. Yes. Because uh, for catching the smallest animals that we have here at the Sea Life Center. Can hold one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hand you those to end there. <laughs> this is the net we've used for catching plankton. It's a large, large net. It doesn't have to be, but it's really efficient because the water column that it's going through is much larger. You can have a smaller plankton net. In fact, we do have one right here. This one was for the aquarium department, but this is our plankton net in the education department. If we wanted to go out and collect plankton for just a program, uh, and maybe that'd be a fun one to do, is a virtual visit that where we, cool. we do a fresh plankton <laughs> tow, and we go and we see what we've got in it. Because we're going to look at some of the microscope footage that we have from the other day. Yeah. Take a look at those. While we're here, we got a question here. Oh, okay. Do we keep the plankton? Yes, we, we, <laughs> we do keep the plankton once it's here. Um, and we can do a couple things with it. Either uh, we do have filter feeder animals here that if we add the plankton to their tank, the plankton will cruise around and slowly feed those animals. Um, or we can keep them in plankton tanks, which have a fancy name. It's a chrysal tank, um, which basically what the chrysal tank does is it just circulates the water around in it. So we do have tanks that we can keep them in. Uh, right now, our chrysal tank only has those little spot pronzoia um, or spot shrimp. But we, we could have other plankton in there as well. And we're going to show you, the, the spot shrimp is not the only uh, crustacean to have uh, like a planktonic form. This one's a little different, though, because the spot shrimp eventually grow up. So you can see this little thing whipping around in there. Uh, we finally were able to find a couple that were pretty still, though. So don't worry. I just wanted to show you just how speedy they can be. This is another planktonic crustacean called a copepod. So I think, what? there it is, it's whipping in. So we're gonna find one that is not moving here in a moment. And we'll see just where it is. You can see all sorts of weird shapes in there. So here's the copepod. Now this is different from the spot shrimp because the spot shrimp eventually grows out of its planktonic stage. It becomes non-planktonic. Copepods are just gonna be plankton forever. <laughs> um, now there are actually some benthic copepods, which means they, they settle out on the bottom, they crawl around. Technically not planktonic at that point once they're not moving in the current, but they're always going to stay this small. And so it's like a teeny, teeny, tiny little shrimp or, uh, you know, they're related to shrimp and crab. Uh, and they do have one eye. If you look up at the very, very tip of them, there's a little red dot there. And that is their singular eye. Here's one that was closer to the camera uh, and we had to kind of focus it in. But you'll see all these little uh, spots on it, but there's one out at the very, very tip in between the two large antennae there, and that is the eye. And we were actually able to find a copepod that had eggs. Uh, so their whole, life, their whole life cycle takes place at this very tiny microscopic level. And even in those eggs, you can see the eye spots. So this is kind of similar to those shrimp that we had, where they had eggs, they kept the eggs with them, those eggs will hatch out. This copepod was just carrying around its eggs as well. I couldn't tell you how close they were to hatching, though. I'm not, I'm not too familiar with I'm it. not an expert either, but no. that is a really good shot of the eye. The eye on the copepod yeah. there, that one front eye. Uh, 
I, you know, I, more of an eye spot. Right, it's, right, right, right. It's going to collect uh, mostly shadows and that sort of thing. But while we were looking around, we found uh, some other stuff that was pretty exciting to see. This is another animal that starts life as plankton and then becomes non-planktonic. Believe it or not, this is the larvae of an echinoderm like a sea star. Uh, I think it's probably from a sea star, just having looked at some images, maybe even a brittle star. But sea urchins and sea cucumbers also began life uh, in sort of these little planktonic stages. And each, each type of echinoderm, or spiny-skinned animal, each one looks a little different in its plankton stage. So I do think this one's from a sea star. Looks like a little spaceship. It really does. It really does look like a little spaceship. Or even like a fish, maybe? Yeah, or, or like yeah. a fish, like like, 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 a, like, a, like an angelfish going yeah. backwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's an interesting shape. And a lot of plankton actually have this sort of structure where they've got all sorts of spines. Um, one, plankton will eat plankton, but two, having more little spines out in the water will actually keep you uh, drifting longer rather than settling out. You don't want to just settle out because all your food is probably up in the water column as well. And that brings us to plankton plants or phytoplankton. So we've been looking at zooplankton, um, which is animal plankton. But here, what we've got on here, these little chains of green dots, that's actually plant plankton or phytoplankton. And you can kind of see over just, whoop, uh, over to the left there in focus now, there's one with spines, just like the echinoderm larvae had spines. And that basically helps it drift around better in the water. One of my favorite parts of looking at all of this was when you had to like focus it in like different layers of the water. Yes. It was like some of them would be on like the top layer of water. So if you're watching it, like go like the camera, like go a little bit down deeper. Yeah. I would through, say. Like through, through layers different of layers of water. Yeah. It's very interesting. So it, like there it focuses on the top. Yeah. The microscope does. And then, it, and then back down to the bottom there. Yeah. yeah. It's it's and that's very one reason we don't fill the whole petri dish with them, because if we just fill the petri dish, you're gonna have you're never gonna find stuff. You're gonna have to go through so many layers to find stuff. Or if you're like that little um, copepod or even this next one, you're gonna be whipping around and almost impossible to find. So this we were able to find. Uh, this is an arrow worm. So this is a little aquatic uh, plankton. It, it's going to swim around um, and uh, kind of worm-like. It's very squiggly when it moves. We didn't get it moving, but honestly, we wouldn't be able to capture it on film with this microscope if it was moving because it would just whip off frame really quick. But we do get a little close-up of its head. And I think, yeah, it's got some little eye spots up there too. <laughs> we decided it kind of looked like a little cartoon dinosaur. Yes, it does. Um, <laughs> Maybe a little bit of a snake, too. A little snake, yeah. Look at its eyes. Uh, yeah, I like the eyes on there. That. So that was the arrow worm. Great shot there. And another one we got uh, pretty cool. We only got one of these, but we will see uh, more or less, um, depending on kind of the time of year and what our weather's looking like. This is a swimming snail. Um, so this is actually called a pteropod, spelled with a P, <laughs> P-T-E-R-O-P-O-D. And that means wing foot. Uh, or wing feet, and so you can see there it actually kind of scuttled around. If it was in the water column when it was wiggling there, it would have actually swum itself up in the water. So this is a snail. Um, I'm going to kind of try to demonstrate, I guess. Think of like the snail shell and the little snails at the bottom. So if that was upside down, the foot of the snail would be up top. And instead of that foot just being, you know, the single like slimy foot that most snails have, this one's kind of lobed, and it flaps those lobes around while it's hanging upside down. And it kind of cruises around in the water, which some people call them sea butterflies is a nickname that these pteropods have. But you can see they do have a, a little shell, just like a snail we might be familiar with. There are some uh, shell-less pteropods as well called sea angels, uh, and many of those actually are predators of these shell pteropods. So we have a question here. Okay. What magnification are we seeing now? I believe oh. it came in with the arrow worm. Yeah. Um, um, I can't remember. I can't recall. I do know, um, for anyone uh, familiar with microscopes, we were using um, like a, a dissecting scope instead of a compound scope. Um, so I'm not sure magnification, but it wasn't it wasn't like hundreds of, no, of times. No, we didn't have to use like an oil or anything. No, to which we sure. didn't get. We didn't get a uh, super close up shot of the phytoplankton because we were using that that microscope without crazy zoom on it. Uh, most of the phytoplankton is actually very very tiny. Um, very small compared to the, the larger plankton we've been looking at. So you have to have like a really good microscope. Um, some phytoplankton, uh, things like um, 
oh gosh, I'm going like diatoms. Yep, yep, yep. The, I mean, the, you, you can use a scanning electron microscope uh, to actually image them and they still, you know, they, they, they would get larger, but sometimes uh, you can get a scanning electron microscope image of them. They're so, so small. Those yeah. ones are really fascinating. But with the zooplankton, when we were looking at it, you could actually look in the bucket mm -hmm. and know where you were using the pipette to try and point. like pipette them up so that they could get into the petri dish. That's a great point. These are all things that could be seen with the eye. Yeah. You just might not be able to make out the most details about them. No. Um, so that technically makes these then macro invertebrates. Uh, these are invertebrates that are big enough to see with, with your eye, but... If you really want detail, that's kind of where the microscope comes in. So that's a good question. Oh, it looks like... Oh, like, like 10 times 10, or so. 10, 10 it, times or something more. It's probably more than yeah, that. Yeah, maybe 40. like 40 would be a good guess for a lot of these little ones. Um, and in fact, we use this like if we have in-house programs. Um, we've used uh, microscopes at like 40 times looking at brine shrimp, for example. Um, again, I, I think this might be a little more than that. This could be up to 50 or more. Um, but yeah, it's not an extreme microscope to, to find these. So if anyone remembers sea monkeys, yep, <laughs> that's what these are. We this did a whole brine shrimp. Oh yeah, you're yeah. right, we did. Be sure and tune back into our brine shrimp episode. Yeah, that was virtual one visits. of the first or... Back in the yeah. fall, I believe. It was way back there. We had a aquarist, Leo, uh, led us around and we actually grow these brine shrimp here at the center. These are a food source for a lot of our filter feeders. And you can see uh, these black dots in there that they're bumping into. Those are actually the cysts or the, uh, the unhatched eggs uh, in this little sample of brine shrimp. Yeah. So what about like the plankton that we, do we always see the same plankton? No. And so that's like, if we, if we always saw the same plankton, we probably wouldn't be doing plankton toes like in the middle of winter. Right. We certainly do less plankton toes in winter, <laughs> but we will get out there and kind of see what there is. And that's because there's a seasonality to the plankton. There's, um, there's almost like plankton weather, if you think about it, right? Uh, obviously, if you're a phytoplankton, if you're uh, a plant plankton, you need the sun. Uh, so we see a lot more of those in the summertime, a lot, lot less in the winter. And there are actually copepods that will just like gorge themselves on uh, phytoplankton all summer long. And then they don't have that phytoplankton around in the winter. What they'll do is they'll build up lipids. They'll build up like a little fat store. And so in the in the colder times, you can find these copepods, and they've got like a little little fat sack on them, uh, and they'll live off of that in these uh, in these times where there's less phytoplankton. So we don't always see the same phytoplankton, and we want to try and keep track of what we are seeing. Yeah. Uh, there are harmful planktons. If you've ever heard of like uh, you know uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, toxic uh, shellfish poisoning, right? Um, those sorts of things are related to the planktons that are out there. And there's certain planktons that can like produce toxins. So one, we want to keep an eye on those plankton for sure, see if anything is happening with those because we do draw in water from the, the ocean here at the center. The pipe, like how long is the pipe that we're drawing that water? It is 300 feet. About 300 deep. feet, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is really awesome. But sometimes we actually get plankton that will come in through all of our pipes. Why don't we pull up the bioluminescent plankton? Ooh, we plankton. did get that. Yep. So this, is, this isn't from the plankton toe. No, correct. This isn't from that net. This was plankton that was found in one of the filters for our tanks. And those tanks actually receive uh, raw sea water, but we do filter it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that filter catches all your little uh, critters in there. I believe we thought these were copepods, but they are bioluminescent copepods. How cool that is. So you, you can see there that those little blue specks that come up. That's actually light being produced by these copepods. It can be used uh, in several different ways. In this case, it's probably an escape mechanism. Like they use this light to either startle their predators away uh, or distract their predators while they run away. It doesn't work for us. We just find it really fascinating. If I anything, say, I think it makes it even cooler. <laughs> yeah. uh, some animals can also use bioluminescence to lure uh, food to them. You know, mm -hmm. famously like the angler fish can have little glowing lures. Um, and then they'll also use it to communicate or find members of their own species as well. Another cool thing about this is Stephanie actually took this plankton and gave it to our sea pens. Oh, yeah. 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 We've That's had those true. sea pens in the past. Those are related to uh, like anemones and yeah. corals. They have little polyps on them that all have these tentacles, just like the, the if you think of the anemones with all their tentacles out, but like teeny, teeny, tiny and all lined up on. It, look, it looks like a... Like a, a quill. A, a quill pen. Yeah. But then it can like suck its way down into the sand. Yeah. So that's a filter feeder. Usually yeah. gets those brine shrimp. But when we do find a bunch of plankton, either in a plankton tow or if we find just a, a ton of it in a filter, it can get fed out to our, our other animals here. Yeah. It's not looking like we have any other questions here. Perfect. I'll do a last call yeah. on any questions. If we're, if we're missing your question somehow, 
Um, you know, please, uh, if, if you hang out a little bit after you sign off, we'll, we'll try and get some questions if we see them in the chat. Also, if you just wake up and you're like, oh gosh, I wish I'd asked this, you can leave a comment on the video and we'll try to get to that. Or you can email us at asktuffy, which is A-S-K-T-U-F-F-Y at alaskasealife.org. We got one. Oh, right in. All right. Are plankton an indicator species for the health of the marine environment? Many are, yes. yes. And when we talk about like things like toxic algal blooms, the, the bloom, uh, that can be caused by like a misbalance of nutrients in the water. Um, famously, you either can have like these dead spots or these toxic algal blooms uh, where there's large areas of runoff containing um, like, a, like fertilizer from farmland and that sort of thing. So they, they can totally be an indicator species. Um, likewise, I'm gonna pull up, I, I love pteropods. They're probably one of my favorite things we get here. But if you look at that shell, it is transparent. You can see the guts of the uh, snail there. Pteropods are a big, big species of concern uh, when we talk about things like ocean acidification, because their shell is already so small, so thin, it doesn't take a lot of pocking um, or, or you know, being worn away by that uh, acidic water uh, to actually impact these animals. They do need that shell. And so they're a big, big animal concern. And you know, if they go, they are a food source for a lot of animals. Here in Alaska, salmon, for example, love the, the, uh, the pteropods yeah. when they're all cruising around. Copepods as well are a big, a big food source. A lot of these plankton are, you know, either they're eaten by other plankton, uh, and then those plankton might get eaten by something, or there's like things like the the pteropod that just get eaten outright by small fish and, and that sort of thing. So they are a big indicator. For sure, and also plankton can be found in other forms of bodies of water as well, like oh, yeah. rivers, lakes, and yeah, sort of freshwater really copepods. Water. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, that is a great question. All right, I'm gonna uh, thank our sponsor here <laughs> real quick. Uh, if there's any other questions, we'll keep an eye on it. But as always, we want to thank Royal Caribbean Group for making it possible for us to bring you these programs. It's always fun to, to get out here, show you what we're doing, uh, and also uh, you know, uh, sort of answer questions, interact with the public. We love doing it. So thank you, Royal Caribbean Group, for letting us do that. Uh, and with that, I don't see any other questions. Again, don't either. If, if you get one in last minute, just stick around. We'll try to answer that. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we hope that you all have enjoyed this virtual visit, and we'll see you again soon. So long.